My name is Lawrence Holmes. Uh, I was born in 1935 and I run the Varian Bunkers uh, Museum. Uh, I am also a member of the Royal Observer Corps Association. So could you describe the role of the bunkers like Varian um, during the course of, of the Cold War? When was this bunker actually built and how many were there roughly in the United Kingdom? Well, 1,600 were built between 1955 and 1965. Uh, they were concrete shelters underground, three feet underground. Um, uh, they had a protection factor of 1,000 because the observers had to be protected uh, to carry out their, their role. Their role was, as I've described, the posts were at the sharp end. Uh, the posts reported the raw data that is the actual marks made on a sensitive piece of paper as to the bearing, elevation and spot size of a nuclear weapon. Uh, the uh, radioactive or, or, or the radiation readings um, were those that would appertain at the post site. In other words, the observers, although they were down below in their protected accommodation, would have ex been experiencing radioactive uh, fallout levels at their post and they would simply report them. Um, the uh, Geiger counter or the ionization chamber which picked up the intensity of radiation was placed up top as it were and a wire connected it to a meter down below so the observers could read the varying levels of radiation uh, uh, remotely. So uh, uh, but the posts were at the sharp end uh, all their readings that would be sent in, I'll call it raw data readings, it's, it's a bit like weather reporting, uh, they will be sent into the ops rooms. Uh, there were some 35 ops rooms built originally, later reduced to 25, and uh, all the raw data uh, would be plotted on maps. Uh, the warning teams of the United Kingdom Warning and Monitoring Organisation were placed there as well. Uh, it was their role to sort out radioactive decay, sort out where the fallout was going and to issue warnings to the public, just like the warnings to the public of the approach of uh, enemy aircraft in World War II. Uh, so, so that was the tie-up. So how deep are we at Varian Bunker and how safe would this bunker have actually been in the event of a nuclear blast? Well Varian is three feet below ground and, and most of them were three feet. Um, where they couldn't achieve three feet of, of earth cover uh, for various reasons, uh, the, the, there would be a mound of earth put over the top. The idea was that there would be at least three feet of earth, because three feet of earth is, is very good, I'll call it insulation, against uh, radioactive fallout and radiation. Uh, so uh, it's got a protection factor, as I say, of a thousand, which meant if there was a thousand rad up top, we'd only get one down here. Uh, so a very safe place to be in actual fact. Okay. <coughs> and why were these bunkers actually positioned in remote areas? Well, they weren't deliberately put in remote areas, but uh, when Okumo uh, had the requirement for a monitoring organisation to track radioactive fallout and nuclear weapons, they simply took over the network of ROC posts. Uh, those posts were positioned to suit uh, reporting aircraft. Uh, they were generally on high ground, they were generally between 10 and 15 miles apart, and the layout of the aircraft posts suited the required layout for nuclear posts. So all they did generally uh, was to actually build a nuclear bunker at the side of the old aircraft reporting post. They were not done for any other reason. It did save new leases uh, being arranged. In the case of Varian, Varian Aircraft Reporting uh, Post was placed on Calm Beacon. And uh, uh, when we turned nuclear, uh, there was opposition to the nuclear bunker being placed on Calm Beacon because it is a hallowed piece of ground. It was a Elizabethan the first beacon site. And uh, uh, there was local opposition and so uh, the MOD built Varian Bunker two miles to the south on their head. Uh, so we're slightly unusual in that we are not on the site of the former aircraft reporting post. 
but by far the overwhelming majority actually were, 95% were built at the side of the aircraft reporting post. And how were the bunkers themselves laid out? Uh, when you say laid out, you mean the distribution of rooms and things like that. Um, well, a bunker, uh, as I said, is a concrete uh, shelter underground, about four metres by three metres by two and a half metres high, walls 12 inches thick. Now, there's an access hatch and ladder way down one end and a ventilation turret on the other end. Um, uh, the, 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 the access ladder gives uh, goes down to a, a small toilet come a plant room uh, and, and that has a chemical toilet in it uh, and various tools that are needed to operate the post. But the main room is the monitoring room, <coughs> it's by far the biggest room and that's designed to hold three observers for three weeks in the aftermath of a nuclear war. And that monitoring room contains all the instruments uh, that are required to measure uh, where the nuclear weapons have gone off, uh, radioactive fallout, food, water, uh, telephones, radios, uh, generating sets and all the paraphernalia needed to exist for three weeks. After the three weeks was <coughs> up, what would happen to the people in the bunker? Well, three weeks was picked because the scientists told us that that's the length of time it would take for radiation uh, to fall to levels where the survival forces could begin to come out and operate. Now, that's not just the core, that is local government, it's the RAF, it's the fire service, police, etc, etc. So it will be a question of, at long last, after a nuclear strike, we could begin to come out of our holes, our homes, our cellars, our shelters or whatever, and try and begin to piece together life after a nuclear attack. The Observer Corps would have emerged at that stage. And of course it depends on the scenario and where the bombs have gone off, whether you could in actual fact go home or not. Uh, it may be that the Corps was uh, kept on duty, as it were, even after three weeks. Uh, although I personally can't see much point in that. Um, I think we would be desperate to get home and see what was happening back home. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, it, but the role of survival after the three weeks, the core was, uh, that was not the core's role. Uh, we, we were told almost nothing about what would happen after three weeks, and perhaps quite rightly so, our war would have finished. I often tell people, visitors down Berrien Bunker, that our war would be three weeks in, in length, and the bulk of that would be quite boring, because we'd have a very intense period of reporting nuclear weapons, and then we'd start reporting the uh, radiation dose rates every five minutes and that would continue for three weeks um, and uh, so, so it's a, a three-week war. <clears throat> what would it have been like to have lived in this bunker? I can only say grim because um, um, these bunkers um, are 55 degrees summer and winter, there's no heat um, they can feel quite damp. The observer core put on the roof and the sides, polystyrene tiles, uh, rubroid matting on the <coughs> um, floor uh, to make it feel slightly warmer. They issued us with naval duffel coats and observers got up to weird and wonderful ways of keeping warm, such as three pairs of socks, two sweaters and what have you. Um, and, uh, uh, but it was still cold. Uh, bluntly, I've only ever served in one of these uh, posts, bunkers, for a maximum of um, one night. So, say, coming on duty at nine o'clock one evening and going off duty at nine o'clock the next morning, 12 hours. And that was enough for me. I was frozen. Um, so the thought <coughs> that had I been one of the crew on duty when the bomb had gone off, the thought of actually serving in here for three weeks in those conditions, I suppose it's what the alternative might be. And at least in a post, you might be frozen, you might be cramped, uh, you might be miserable, uh, but at least you were safe. Um, and uh, it was better than the alternative, as it were, perhaps. But, uh, uh, and you had got food, you had got water. 
but they were pretty primitive places to be in. Uh, I don't know of anyone that served, that stayed down one of these posts for a week, for example. Uh, many, many people have served one day, uh, but not a week. <coughs> How often were exercises held and what did such exercises consist of? We had um, about six exercises a year. Um, one of those would have been 24 hours, uh, but most of them were eight hours. Um, <coughs> nine o'clock till six o'clock or something like that. Um, <coughs> and uh, 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 that was the time when we would play our nuclear war games. Um, the Observer Corps um, uh, eventually got a computer uh, which would allow them to calculate um, the bearings and elevations and spot sizes for all the weapons that they decided to detonate for that exercise. Uh, they would apply one day's weather, which they got from the Met Office, and the computer would work out every five minute reading, every bearing and so on. And this would be sent to uh, every post on a narrative uh, and uh, all the dose rate readings were put on an EPROM. Uh, I will, that's an EPROM. Um, uh, we would call it a memory stick now, um, but uh, <coughs> that would be fed into a, a device which would be coupled into the fixed survey meter and provided you switched it on at the right time, then it would give the correct readings for that exercise. Uh, and we would simply look at the uh, fixed survey meter and, and report those readings for the duration of the exercise. So again, an exercise would be very intense in the first hour when you were reporting bearings, elevations to nuclear weapons. Uh, but thereafter, it would actually be just a series of five minute readings. Um, a, a bizarre sort of happening was uh, the, 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 the was a feature of exercises was because exercises were expensive to put on, uh, they used to detonate on the UK for that exercise anything up to 250 nuclear weapons. Now, that frankly is ludicrous from a reality point of view. But because the idea was to train the maximum number of people for the maximum amount of time in the maximum number of ways, they used to unreally actually detonate a far, far greater number of weapons uh, than, than was real, quite honestly. Um, and uh, so in the ops rooms, in the poor old ops rooms, some of the displays were so complex because for every bomb that was burst on the ground and out of 250 weapons that may be concerned in that exercise, maybe 200 would be ground burst. You'd have all these plumes crossing the country. The country would be absolutely covered in a multiplicity of plumes. Uh, and anyone seeing it would have said, oh, no chance, we would not survive that at all. And you wouldn't. But exercises in that sense were unreal. Um, but they did give us practice in reporting and assessing and reading all the various elements concerned in nuclear reporting. So what would have been the first indication of a nuclear strike and how would you have reacted? The first indication of a nuclear strike down here in the post underground would be a reading on the bomb power indicator. The bomb power indicator is just up here on my right. Um, <coughs> that would show a reading and that would be instantly reported as a priority call toxin 67 post. The time and the pressure would be reported and then after that you would actually go upstairs and change the papers in the ground zero indicator come down and they will be assessed in terms of bearing elevation and spot size. A lot of people have said to me at uh, varying bunker open days, well, you wouldn't have gone out of this safe place to change the papers, would you? And I said, well, that was the idea. Uh, and I explained to them that uh, we would have changed those papers 60 seconds after the bomb had gone off. 60 seconds was chosen because uh, all the instant things which happen when a nuclear weapon goes off, like the heat flash, the blast wave, the gamma flash would have gone. And all the radioactive fallout would be up in the mushroom cloud and in theory there would be none down here. So in theory it would have been safe for us to go out and change the papers. Um, 
that was the theory in, in actual fact. What was the general mood among the uh, Royal Observer Corps members during the darker years of the Cold War? Um, and through into even the counterculture of the 1970s, the late 1960s, the 1970s, there was a very clear shift in the cultural mood of the nation. How did that affect the Royal Observer Corps? I don't think it affected it at all, quite honestly, um, because um, when we took on the role uh, from 1955 or from 1960, uh, when we took on that role, the people who actually performed it either believed in that role or not. Um, most of them who were still in the core by 1970s uh, were very much into the nuclear role. And of course the newcomers, the people that joined the core after 1960, they knew no other role. Uh, so they came in fresh, that was the only thing they knew. They either liked it or they didn't, and if they didn't they left. Um, so we believed in what we were doing. And in actual fact, I wasn't particularly aware of political ups and downs. Um, I did my job in the Royal Observer Corps of training and practicing nuclear war games, uh, nuclear plotting, with the same level of intensity or correctness, uh, irrespective of what the political climate was. Um, and I can't say that I was, apart from the Cuban crisis, I can't say that I was more nervous at one particular period or another. Um, I found it slightly difficult in 1989 to believe what was happening with Gorbachev and the Berlin Wall coming down. I found that difficult to believe. Uh, but it did, and it's a it's historical fact now that communism collapsed and everything else. So, uh, uh, but at the time, I, I could hardly believe it.